we can look at how the councils actually had to answer what culture was bringing up. And that's something that we have to keep doing. And I think right in our time, uh, the church needs to be able to freshly articulate that which is ever the same. We welcome you today to a very special program, I have to be honest, with a very good friend, a respected friend, Father Stephen Muse. We're going to speak today about his new book, The Most Important Question. But before we get to that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Father Stephen. Father Stephen is serving the Holy Transfiguration Orthodox Church community in Columbus, Georgia, while also working as a pastoral psychotherapist and marriage and family therapist at the Pastoral Institute where he currently directs the clergy in Keros or Kairos, a week-long intensive therapy and discernment program for clergy and their spouses. He is a board certified chaplain, CPE supervisor, and is a clinical professor in both psychiatry and behavioral science and bioethics and medical humanities at Mercy University Medical School. He is the author of numerous books, including the one we'll be sharing with you today, and his work has been translated into Romanian, Greek, Swedish, Serbian, and Russian. Father Stephen and his wife, Presbyter Ioana, have four children, five grandchildren, and 12 godchildren, and have made their home in Columbus, Georgia since 1992. An interesting fact, prior to his entry into the Greek Orthodox Church in 1993, he pastored a Presbyterian congregation for 11 years and helped begin an outpatient psychiatric clinic in Delta, Pennsylvania. He was ordained to the Holy Priesthood in 2021. Father, once again, welcome to the program. Thank you, Father Chris. Before we get into more specifics, can you give us a little bit of an overview of what your book is about and probably why you were inspired to write it? Well, it's a kind of a, a patchwork of uh, standalone small pieces that uh, I have a patchwork of uh, standalone small pieces that uh, I hope uh, help people find Christ in, in our context. Uh, I, try, I like writing and I've been writing since I was in high school. And these are uh, essays drawn on um, patristics, liturgics, scripture, and psychology to try to help people find uh, their question to Christ and to answer the one he's putting to us, the most important question. Well, there's, there's a lot in the book and there's no way we're gonna get through it all today, but let's touch upon a few topics so our audience can get a sense of it. First, why is it so important to have a correct understanding of theological concepts? Well, St. Sophroni uh, makes an important comment that he encountered the uncreated light many times as a young man, and it took him 20 years to come to a dogmatic understanding of what he'd encountered. And we see that in the church as well. The encounter with Christ is first, and then the understanding of what exactly this is comes later. And we can look at how the councils actually had to answer what culture was bringing up. Culture uh, tried to comprehend Christ in ways that weren't accurate by the people that actually knew him. And so that forced culture to, or forced the church to articulate very clearly using philosophical categories, exactly who they'd encounter. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have to keep doing. And I think right in our time, we have some pretty serious uh, things arising like an anthropological, um, question that we really are going to need, I think, a church council on. And, it, and there are several things that are contributing to that from artificial intelligence, uh, digital media, to the identity politics. And so uh, the church needs to be able to freshly articulate that which is ever the same. This is a very important function. And when we don't do that, we end up in the eddies marginalized as something in the backwaters. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And, um, and where do you see sort of the consequences of this 
theological misunderstanding or a lack of understanding playing out even well, like today. I mean, there's so much out there. You bet. I, I think one thing has been spoken of by many people, and that is what happened in the division between the East and the West. So Western culture has been formed. Its ethos is very different than the Byzantine culture. And so uh, rational scientific work and the rise of um, business and material things has superseded the encounter with one another in communion, which I would say was more of the treasure of the Eastern church. So one of the problems is by now, after all these years of small changes, um, Western culture is a very materialistic, isolated culture. Very, I think um, there's a lot of uh, self-love and uh, a narcissism that's present and this is a result of falling away from the truth of the church and no longer realizing it because what i think occurs is the church becomes a humanistic organism and then by being identified with a colonialist imperialism that destroyed every culture it touched turning it into whatever the western europeans wanted Christianity has developed a, a bad name, and so people now associate in the West Christianity with oppression, and and it's it's ironic because Christianity is what gave us freedom and love in the purest sense. You know, in today's world, I'm sure you travel and I've traveled too. You walk through the airports, or you even go to a business, or even shopping, and everyone is just has their iPhone out or whatever device they have. And they're no longer relating to one another, let alone Christ himself. Um, yeah. How, in your opinion, can we improve relationships with each other as members of the church? What does healthy Christian relationship look like, in your opinion? Well, I think that relates to the first question you asked. And it's, I would say, first of all, we come to orthodoxy because the uncreated light in the form of a mustard seed of faith moves us. No one comes to Christ apart from that. If they do, it's not a, a real connection. And so the problem with having not losing our, our kids, for example, 50% leave in college in the Orthodox Church, at least among the Greeks, I think the problem there is that they haven't tasted the uh, uncreated grace and the ontological, they don't understand the ontological difference as a, as a result between from psychology and simply majority vote. Uh, so Christ is, uh, the church is not a social institution. It's not a business. It's a living, iconic communion that comes from above. And when we taste this and we relate to one another that way, and I realize that when you, you and I are speaking, my experience of you is not you. You are beloved to Christ on the other side of my experience. So in order to reach you, in order to encounter you, I have to first go through Christ. That means a matania, my head on the ground. That means I must be able to be in question about whatever it is I think I know or experience before I meet you. Because when I encounter you, I'm going to encounter someone new, and Christ is going to give me something through you different than I've ever had. So the uniqueness of each person becomes the greatest adventure that we have. But there's no way to encounter one another apart from repentance that's continual, and then the um, unknowing of love, because Christ is the ontological bridge that unites you and me. We can't encounter one another apart from him. So I see this as the most important dimension of the church and to try to make, to try to have love among people simply psychologically, simply by tools and uh, self-help books and things is, is a destined to fail. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, many uh, commentators today have spoken about the increasing so-called secularization of the world. Some Christians feel that it's, becoming more difficult to exist in the world and still remain a Christian. In your opinion, Father Stephen, how can we approach the world 
in a way that prioritizes our relationship with God without entering into judgment, avoidance, or self-righteousness about our fellow man. Well, I think that's the journey away from ideology uh, to uh, the freshness of encounter. We have to remember that Christ was killed by the religious, most educated people. Mm -hmm. And the disciples basically confessed that they were trying to go in the same direction. There's one amazing sentence I didn't discover for 70 years. And that was when the disciples say to Jesus after he got into a, a discussion with the Pharisees, just before he sees the Syrophoenician woman, Lord, do you realize that you upset the Pharisees? <laughs> How did I miss that for 70 years? So bless them, they confessed that they were into the politics of the time, they wanted a kingdom, they wanted to be the greatest, they wanted to be the best, and so they were en route to doing the same thing that the Pharisees were gonna do to Christ. Mm -hmm. So their word to us is, watch out, mm -hmm. you're gonna do it too. Because if you don't have grace and continual repentance, and the movement in community in Christ, you will be forever stuck in the old man, hammering one another, and you will kill me. And this, because I don't see this in myself, I can be the judge. I look at a person and instead of having a heart that softens because I'm gonna discover Christ, I say, hmm, He's got a ring in his nose. He's got a tattoo. Uh, he doesn't think about things the way I do. So, oh, what's this do? Well, that makes me nervous. That scares me because they're different. Now what? Now I have to suffer the ascetical forbearance of bearing my experience of my own judgments about you so that I can encounter you. Hmm. This is... Love doesn't come without a cross and forgiveness from the get-go. And that means I'm going to have to suffer you. Now, Sartre said that other is hell. Hmm. They can be if I'm the judge. But if the other is Christ, they're paradise. And my brother is my life. All right, so taking off what you just said, which was fantastic, how then do we best approach increasing our understanding outside of the pressures to choose among the numerous competing established narratives that are out there today, Father? Well, the ethos of the world is definitely compacting us, and through digital media and everything that we're absorbing, we're getting 90% of our input in something that's not of Christ at one level. Yeah. So we really need the church. We need the sacraments. We need prayer rules. We need regular confession. We need spiritual father. We need what orthodoxy offers, but not as a uh, to become a good boy. We have to realize that what it's about is the undoing of the old man. And so our practical theology on the ground is going to be resistance in one sense to the ethos around us, but not as a, as a battle or a condemning thing, but a resistance the way we resist uh, Logie's me. Mm -hmm. I have to discern that when I'm uh, adding up, when I'm looking at uh, my stocks on the, on the computer, that I'm becoming addicted slowly to the pleasure of seeing if I can increase my money. I now have a competing God there. Hmm. Uh, so then when I try to pray, Elder Emiliano says, if you're distracted, you don't love God. I love this. If you don't get fanatical about it, what it means is basically, I see the toll houses that I'm confronting in each thought. One says, don't you want to think about your money? Don't you want a ham sandwich? Don't you want to remember that person you met? Okay, all of these things become attractors. 
if I'm not paying attention neptically to my inner life and bringing it before God and in confession, I'm not going to be able to be different than the culture's making me. Because the culture is incredibly powerful now. I think we went through first uh, the disillusionment of the 50s and 60s, where after social activism within the church, they were they were dead, and people started looking at psychedelics and going to Eastern religions. And this set us up for the internet. And now we are just completely hooked on constantly feeding information and delights into us. This is addicting us, and it's also bio, bio behaviorally through the algorithms, destroying the culture by making us angry with each other as we become more and more social isolated. So we need the church desperately now, and people are flocking to the orthodoxy all over the country now for different reasons, but it's going to be our responsibility to help them taste and nurture the Christ of love and repentance that's drawing them. No, absolutely, Father. Well, what do you hope uh, readers will take away from your book? What impact do you hope it will have on their lives? Well, I hope that uh, by the way that the essays are written, that it will fan the flame of their faith and invite them to the things we've always known and, and the church has always known are life-giving, and that's repentance love the awareness of my failure and of how seduced I am by my own egotism and self-love. Uh, St. Isaac the Syrian says, when you go to prayer, you should go as a child without knowledge. I think this is also true for life. If you want to meet another person, if you want to see, hear the birds sing, if you want to have joy, stop knowing everything. Stop trying to produce something and doxologize, orthodoxia, instead of the illusions of kinodoxia, of empty glory, of self-esteem, of love. I don't need to be anything. I hear my resume read. I think, ah, this is nothing. I'm an old man that if you didn't give me any credit, you would see what I'm capable of if I got stuck in the gulag or there was a fire somewhere and I had to deal with it. Then you see who, who I am. Those other things are decoration. Father, well, always a pleasure to see you and to speak with you and to hear from you. When and where can readers purchase the book and what formats will be available? It's out in paperback and also Kindle. Kindle's on Amazon. Both of them are, but I would invite readers to go to Sebastian Press to buy it uh, and see the other things that they have there. They have some really good and creative things. And... Uh, a new book by a metropolitan Zizulus, which is very, very good on uh, remembering uh, the future, which is an, about eschatology, and it's very inspiring. Uh, Thank you, Father. Once again, listeners and viewers, the most important question is the name of the book written by Father Stephen Muse. Thank you, Father Stephen. Thank you, Father Chris.